My name is Don Emerson. I run the Southeast Asia program at the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center in the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. It is my special privilege today to introduce this webinar on the recently held election in Indonesia. Ranked by its population, Indonesia is the fourth largest country, the third largest democratic country, and the largest Muslim majority country in the world. National, regional, and local elections were held there a week ago. Effectively, all of the votes have been counted, and the outcome appears to show that Indonesia's next president will be Prabowo Subianto, who received 58% of the votes. His running mate, Gibran Rakabuming Raka, will become the youngest vice president in the history of Indonesia. Gibran's father, Joko Widodo, is the country's current president. The rest of the votes for president were divided between Anis Baswedan in second place with 25% and Ganjar Pranowo in third place with 16%. Both of the losing candidates for president, Anis and Ganjar, have questioned the fairness of the election, especially in the light of steps taken by or tolerated by President Jokowi that appear to have undercut the quality of democracy in Indonesia. But as of now, there are no signs of systematic electoral fraud. The election's winners are expected to take office in October. In our webinar today, three knowledgeable experts, very knowledgeable experts, will analyze these results and explore their implications. Bill Little, Sana Jaffrey and Gita Widiawan. Bill Little, Emeritus Professor in Ohio State University's Department of Political Science, is effectively the Dean of Indonesian Political Studies in the United States. In his long career, he has excelled in both of the roles professors play as a productive scholar and as a generous teacher. One of his books, written and published in the Indonesian language, uniquely compares Indonesian and American presidents, an appropriate topic today as we discuss Prabowo Subianto's presidency to be. Bill's scholarship on Indonesia and his mentorship of Indonesian students have garnered major awards by several Indonesian institutions. Sana Jaffrey, a research fellow in the Australian National University's Department of Political and Social Change, is younger than Bill, but has more than 15 years. <laughs> yeah, I have to I have to admit that, right? <laughs> younger than Bill, but has more than 15 years of experience doing research in Indonesia. Indeed, she was there observing the run-up to the election earlier this month. Her work on conflict and extremist violence in Southeast Asia has been done at the World Bank and at the Institute for Policy Analysis of Conflict in Jakarta, which she headed in 2021-2022. Her writings have appeared in various academic and policy publications. Her doctorate is from the University of Chicago. Gita Widiawan, my colleague here at Stanford, a well-known Indonesian entrepreneur and currently a visiting scholar at APARC, was in Indonesia for much of the run-up to the election. His current research is on nation building in Southeast Asia and related sustainability issues involving the United States. His previous positions include service as Indonesia's Minister of Trade, Chairman of its Investment Coordinating Board, and founder of the Ankara Foundation. He continues to host the popular educational podcast, Endgame, which I recommend to the audience. His advanced degrees include an MPA from the Harvard Kennedy School. So what's the plan? Mm -hmm. Professor Little will begin by presenting an interpretation of the election results that he has developed together with arguably the leading analyst of public opinion in Indonesia, Professor Saiful Mujani, who received his doctorate in political science under Professor Little at Ohio State in 2003. For clarity and ease of understanding, their argument is laid out in a set of slides that Professor Little will present. Bill Little's presentation will take up to 15 minutes, followed by shorter comments by Sana Jaffrey and Gita Widiawan, and then all three speakers will have a chance to interact between them uh, before the floor is open to questions from our virtual audience around the world. That virtual audience, I might add, numbers at the moment 
more than 500. Bill, the floor belongs to you. This uh, presentation is based on the opinion survey research conducted by Saiful Mujani over many years, and most recently at uh, the so Saiful Mujani Research and uh, Consulting, but before that at the Indonesian Survey Institute. So we have a long history of Saiful doing uh, public opinion research, and I have collaborated uh, a fair amount with him. So what this paper is, is report of his surveys, uh, plus the two of us uh, analyzing the results. Mm -hmm. In the interest of clarity, um, I, uh, in, in the interest of time and clarity, I want to present this in the form of five takeaways. Okay, so here are my five takeaways. Um, the full slides, uh, the full slide presentation is longer, of course, but it is also available. So, so I think so, slide number seven is maybe the last one that I am going to present. And each of these slides elaborates one of these five takeaways. Um, but after that, the full um, the full slideshow is uh, presented. It's just that there's not time to do that now, um, but I wanted everybody uh, both, both here and uh, also everywhere who is watching this uh, to be able to see the full slide presentation. And it includes statistical analysis and so forth. But anyway, what I'm doing now is focusing on these five. Um, Jokowi's performance connected uh, to presidential choice. And what we see in this uh, long analysis and a uh, long set of surveys uh, starting in 20 and uh, 21, 2021 uh, by Saifo Musani. Uh, Mujani Research Consulting. What we see on slide, uh, the slide on the on the left, that's the population of voters who were satisfied or very satisfied. Uh, no, please. Who were satisfied or very satisfied with Joe Coey's performance. That's about 70% of the population. Um, on the other side, about 30% of the population of the electorate of the sample um, are, are those who are not satisfied. Um, so what you can see here is that starting in October 2023, about the time that Gibran uh, became the vice president, uh, on, on vice presidential candidate with uh, Prabowo, um, this, the, the, the support for uh, Prabowo started to rocket. So that's the green line on the left. We're talking about the left slide here. And it's the green line. And it goes from uh, it's October. Uh, uh, it was rising before, but um, but it goes from uh, it rockets from that position. On the other side, on the other side, that's the thirty percent who were less satisfied or not satisfied with the um, with Jokowi's performance. So of course, those people are going to be less happy or aren't going to make different candidate choices. So what we see there is that um, Anis, the yellow line did a little bit better uh, as the election day approached and uh, Ganjar also did a little bit better as the election approached and and Prabowo did less well and uh, the reason for that is of course this is the 30 percent of the mm -hmm. population who uh, liked Joko uh, who did not like Jokowi's performance mm -hmm. and and so all right now let's go back again so the second takeaway is Jokowi helped Prabowo, Prabowo in part by weakening democracy. Prabowo was also helped by Jokowi's systematic and massive illegal state attempt to assure his victory. So I want to emphasize that there is a political element here, as well as the economic element, which was on the last page. And of course, we don't know. Um, we don't know exactly what would have happened, to what extent would Prabowo have won and so forth, if there had not been this illegal state attempt. Uh, but here we have Jokowi saying, I have complete intelligence on all political parties. Uh, on September 16th, 2023, I've seen that clip a couple of times, and it was really chilling, frightening to all of the political party leaders to uh, see that, because they know that he does have that intelligence and that he would use it against them. Uh, the film Dirty Vote uh, released on online February 11th and got I think maybe tens of millions of views released online for Evans describes this attempt. 
uh, the director of the film and the speakers are all well-known public intellectuals, widely respected in Indonesian society. But they were called in for questioning by police on February 13th. So once again, an attempt by Jokowi to chill uh, the voters. Um, and finally, on this, on this slide, the police, army, prosecutors, regional and village government officials were mobilized. This is, this reminds me, you know, I studied almost all of the New Order elections and the Suharto elections, and this was very reminiscent of what Suharto did in those years. Uh, in addition, massive Islamic organizations, Nahdad ulama also, and Muhammadiyah, very well known uh, to anybody who follows Indonesian politics, were allegedly bought off with aid. Um, allegedly, because we don't have that actual evidence, but we have not heard a peep from the leadership of either organization, either during the campaign, a critical peep, either during the campaign or after it. Okay, I wanna go back to the takeaways. Thanks. Um, the future is likely unstable in my argument. Economically, and I, again, once again, we have an economic argument and a political argument here. Economically, Prabowo will probably chart a populist course. President Prabowo will be judged by voters primarily for his economic performance. That's what we've seen from that first slide. And all of the evidence we have of the campaigning and so forth is, uh, is that uh, Pre uh, Prabowo got increased support because everybody wanted to continue a, uh, a continuation of Jokowi's economy. Okay, so that's the context. But within that, who will be his minister of finance? Will it be a neoclassical economist or a populist? Uh, the campaign claim from, from uh, Prabowo himself is that his administration will be anti-neolib. Now, the history here, of course, for people who followed Indonesia for a while, is that since the Suharto era, there have been neoclassical economists holding the, these key positions, Ministry of Finance and others. Only one time in democracy was uh, the, were these top positions held by non-neoclassical economists, uh, and that is in the Gus Dur presidency. So every other president has chosen, including Sri Mulyani, uh, now, of course, every other president has chosen to have his economy macroeconomy guided by a neoclassical economist. Equally important is will tax collection become subordinated to the presidential office or remain a part of the Ministry of Finance? Now, the campaign claim here by uh, Prabowo is that direct control by the presidential office, this is something that has not happened before in Indonesian economics, direct control by the uh, presidential office can increase the tax ratio from 10 to 20%. This is a very important issue because it, 10 percent is is too low for uh, Indonesia and the Indonesian economy to really develop uh, properly, and so there is a real need there. But um, but I am concerned that uh, if Prabowo takes direct control of that, that is an enormous source of corruption. So my my main concern here is corruption. And just uh, this week in Tempo. Um, um, Prabowo's campaign manager, uh, Pat Roslan, Pat Roslan uh, said that, yes, this is what we're going to do. He was asked by the Tempo uh, reporter, what is he going to uh, maintain this campaign claim? And, and he says, yes, they are going to take over the tax, uh, uh, tax collection facility from the Ministry of Finance. So that is something that is very worrying to me as well. Okay, let's go back to the, uh, let's go back to the um, takeaway. Yes. Okay. Um, politically, <clears throat> these are two. There are two elements to this argument about uh, the future being unstable. Economically is the first one. Politically is the second one. Politically, Prabowo will probably try to revert to the original 1945 constitution and end direct elections. Okay. Let's go to the Prabowo. Yeah, that's that one. Thank you. All right. How much support? Will Prabowo have in Parliament the Regional Representative Council and in their combined form the People's Consultative Assembly, which has power to change the Constitution? Now, here again, for for people who know Indonesia well, you know that there is this kind of super parliament that combines the regular parliament and the Regional Representative Council. And if you want to change the Constitution, you have to get majority support in that body. 
Um, in 2019, Prabowo expressed strong support for ending direct elections by changing the constitution to its pre-amended undemocratic form. Megawati also strongly actually defended the current democratic version. So here we have set up um, a, a conflict, a political conflict about the future of Indonesian democracy between President Prabowo and, um, and Megawati and others. Okay, of course, this uh, whatever Prabowo wants to do uh, politically uh, with policy, he will have to rely on parliament, uh, see, starting with parliament. So he, he needs to put together a majority in parliament to govern, and then maybe a super majority if he wants to change the constitution. I don't want to go into that uh, because that's tactics, and, and we, as opposed to strategy, this slide is really about strategy, Stra uh, Prabowo's political strategy. But the tactics of that will be putting together uh, these parties. And, and the PDIP is Megawati's party, and Gurindra is, uh, is Prabowo's party. So we see here, um, that's, this is the basis for the competition right there. Um, and uh, we have other small parties uh, as well, which uh, I, I, let me not talk about those now, and you can talk about the smaller parties later if you need to. Uh, okay, let's go back to takeaways. Yes. Okay, the final takeaway is that instability will come from these two challenges to the status quo. Uh, let's go to that slide. That's one, that's the right one. Jokowi, I think, is going to be a weak player. Um, he has few resources of his own. Uh, he's not a party leader. Again, we were talking about the parties. Political parties are really important in Indonesian democracy. They each have leaders, and those leaders have a big impact upon what happens uh, in parliament. Jokowi will be totally cut out of that. Um, second, Vice President Gibran is easy to ignore. It's partly like the American system. It is like the American system in which the vice presidential role is not a major one. And, and, and so in Indonesia, so far, more vice presidents have been ignored than have played a significant role, I think. And so Gibran will be easy to ignore here. And so I'm not talking yet about the specific politics of that, just the, the fact of his constitutional role. So finally, Perhaps Jokowi's only power is his leadership example. Um, and there, there is, this is, the, this is the train that I've been trying to follow, the two-car train that I've been trying to follow uh, through, uh, through this presentation. Uh, Jokowi's impact in terms of economic development really has been positive. It's not just um, uh, whatever the political campaigning and so forth, but the actual record is really impressive. But at the same time, since uh, toward the end of his first term, um, his political record has been negative. And, and what that means is the weakening of democracy, which all of us, many of us have uh, seen and uh, is I think equally important in understanding the probable future. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That was very helpful, very nicely laid out. Sana, I think uh, it's it's your term. Would you like to comment or say anything independent of what Bill has said? Yeah, maybe just to put a little bit of the data that Bill was showing to put it into context for readers who might or, or listeners who might not be so familiar with the outcome itself and just how the, the election, the presidential election in Indonesia works. So the outcome that we know from the, I think about seven over 70% of the votes have been counted. And we know actually even before from quick count, which is a sample-based strategy of, of the results that we can get um, in the same day. So we know with some sort of certainty that Prabowo Subianto has won the election, the Indonesian presidential election, uh, with about 58% of the votes, right? So this is significant um, for two reasons. Not only was he able to get a lot more votes than the other two competitors that he had, he was actually able to clear the 50% threshold for the Indonesian election. So Indonesian elections work in a different way from US presidential elections. First of all, they're based on direct votes. So there's no electoral college. One person gets one vote. Um, there's also uh, a runoff. So if anybody in a three-way race fails to secure a 50% plus one threshold, 50% threshold, then it goes to a second round. And now based on the numbers that Bill has shown, it was actually leading uh, for a very long time towards a Prabowo Subianto victory, he was a leading contender for, for a long time. So in, in many ways, his overall victory was expected. 
Um, I think the question um, that many are now raising is that is that um, whether that victory was expected in a single round. So he was leading in the polls, about 40, 45, 46% stagnated around December. Um, and that's when we heard a, a lot of talk from the president himself, President Joko Vidodo, um, and many of um, the people in his, uh, in his circle, in his officials, about the need to campaign, about his right to campaign. Now, for, the, for US based um, voters or, or people, it might be just very natural to have a president campaign for a candidate that they support. Um, but in Indonesia, this is a major break from established norms of democracy that we've seen in the last 25 years for a sitting president, not only to support somebody publicly, but also support somebody who is his son, right? So essentially what it meant was the president um, declared his intention to side with mm -hmm. a candidate who is paired with his own son, right? And so this sort of created um, unease uh, within observers about what sort of um, you know, siding would, would take place. And what we've heard as Bill um, sort of showed in, in quite a bit of detail um, is that we've seen some meddling in the election and accusations and allegations uh, of meddling in the election. Now, it's important to say that when we often think about electoral meddling um, or allegations of electoral fraud, what it involves is, uh, globally speaking, some sort of meddling in the polls. So either voters are not allowed to vote in certain areas, turnout is depressed in certain areas, or that votes are you know, physically altered or miscounted on purpose, right? That's the sort of thing we... Now, the Indonesian system is very difficult to manipulate in that way because it's based on extremely small polling stations and the polling process, thanks to you know, uh, civil society uh, activists, is under a high level of public scrutiny. Um, and it has about 800,000 polling sites, right? So the size of an average polling station tends to be 200 to 300. Well, my, my own polling site was only, only 200 people, right? And so to manipulate an election through voter fraud, is very difficult to do, and it also does not result in an in a certain outcome, right? Um, and it can be found out easily. And so we've seen some reports of electoral mismanagement. We've seen some reports of irregularity. But if I had to uh, make a if I had to make a claim, I would say that it would be very difficult to prove voter fraud in the voter pro pro voting process at a scale that could alter the outcome, right? So there, there are allegations, they are being investigated, and there is some unease about how the votes were counted. But my understanding, based on having observed these elections before, is that it would be very difficult to use that as a, as a basis for saying the elections have been altered in some way. Where the allegations are more credible um, is in the process leading up to the election, right? So not on the election day itself, but all the process that was leading up to the election. And here we've seen some serious and credible allegations of meddling by the central government and regional government officials in, in, in encouraging voting for Prabhu Subianto and Gibran, um, the pair that won, um, in ways that might have pushed him over the first round threshold um, instead of it going to a second round. Um, and we know from polls that he was widely expected to win in a second round as well. Now, you know, sort of this is important to remember that Prabhu Subianto has maintained a core group of supporters, uh, voters for a very long time. So this is not to say that he has no supporters and all of this is made up. Now, remember he ran in 2014 and 2019 and got 46%, 45, sorry, 45% of the votes, which means about 60, 60 million Indonesians already thought in the previous two elections that he was going to make a good presidential candidate, right? So the question is, where's the difference coming from? Right? So it's really important to remember that he does have support, that people would have voted for him, that Jokowi's brand would have brought him additional voters. The question is, was that enough to guarantee a first round win? And based on the, the kinds of things that um, Bill has described, and we can discuss in more detail, uh, the meddling in terms of influencing um, regional uh, heads to sort of get out the vote in, in favor of a particular candidate, the allegation is that that's the thing that pushed him over the, the edge in the first round, um, and he might not have otherwise done. So I'll stop there, and, and we can discuss the, the rest in um, in a few minutes. Thank you, Sona. Gita? I'm going to make a 
an observation on the economic front uh, in reference to what Bill had alluded to earlier and to some extent what Sana had also. Uh, I think it's important to know that the bar is pretty low from an economic standpoint. Uh, it's important to know that and to note that in the last nine to 10 years, the tax ratio has actually declined from 16% to nine point something percent. Right? I'm not so sure if you know, it's essential to debate about you know, whether or not we ought to have a neoclassical or a neoliberal um, person manning the finance portfolio. And the second observation is that if we take a look at the budget, right, the portion that's been used to service the debt has actually increased from 6% to 16% of the budget. And we all know that it's a zero sum game by way of the fact that every increment that's used for purposes of servicing the debt will be a detriment for purposes of servicing or doing anything else or everything else, including building bridges and sending people to school, providing better health care, and all that good stuff. So I I do believe that. You know, given the fact that Prabhu is leading by way of the official count by KPU approaching 80% of the votes being counted, assuming his presidency, there is likely to be a higher degree of technocratization. And this is by way of the membership within his coalition. Right? If we take a look at the coalescing forces behind Prabowo, inclusive of Golkar, Garindra, and Democrat, which are the largest nationalist ideology parties, I think there is likely to be a higher tendency of technocratizing economic decision making. And, and I'm, I'm paying a bit more attention to SBY or his legacy by way of having been with him you know, previously. I think he has a natural instinct to try to technocratize you know, any type of decision-making, particularly with respect to the economy. And the reason why we might have seen some sort of an underperformance economically in the last nine to 10 years, just to give you some illustration, the GDP per capita in US dollar terms has only gone up by about 40% in the last nine and a half years, as compared to around 200% in the preceding 10 years. The tax revenues have gone up by about 46% in the last nine and a half years, compared to around 190% in the preceding 10 years. I think that to some extent is attributable to the fact that there could have been higher degree of technocratization with respect to the economic decision making. We have seen how the economic portfolios would have been filled with talents that would have been chosen a lot more based on patronage and or loyalty, as opposed to meritocracy. That I think has been a discount. Now I'm making the observation that I think in the context of a Prabowo presidency, apart from the political observation that Bill and Sana have made, I think there is a higher likelihood of technocratization, which will entail a higher degree of tax collection, whether it's directly under the president's office or under the Ministry of Finance, a higher degree of being able to reduce the portion of the budget that's used for servicing the debt. The last point I want to make is that you know, we all know that Prabhu has been sort of like put in a corner for more than two decades by the West. And this, I think, has put a lot of pressure and to some extent created a bit of a desperation. And, you know, by way of illustration, we know that he's made a trip to London for about 16 times in the last four and a half, year, four and a half years. 
that I think is a manifestation of the degree to which he wants to basically appeal to the West. And this is probably going to be necessary in the context of how the government could have been better in attracting foreign direct investment. The foreign direct investment has been at a level of between 26 to $30 billion in the last 10 years, not much more than the preceding 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. And on a per capita per year basis, the FDI for Indonesia is at about $100 compared to that in Singapore at about $19,000, right? For Southeast Asia's countries like the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, and Indonesia, the FDI on a per capita per year basis overs at around $100 to $400, much smaller than that of Singapore. And that, I think, is an impetus for somebody like Prabowo to try to appeal to the West so that he could bring in more capital formation. So I'm, I'm not trying to sound hopeful but I'm making the observation that on the basis of a possibly higher degree of technocratization, there's going to be better economic performance going forward. Let me pause right there. Good. Any interactions among the three, depending upon what you think of what uh, has been said so far? I'm, I'm tempted. Okay. In absent, uh, <laughs> you're being much too polite. Uh, okay, Here, here's a kind of, here's a question from you know, way 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 outside the <laughs> outside the ballpark, right? To what extent will Prabowo turn out to be the Donald Trump of Indonesia? <laughs> this runs directly counter, I think, to Gita's comment about meritocracy. But on the other hand, uh, one might argue that his background, which is military his association with violence of various kinds. And I, I, I use that phrase, you know, very carefully because I'm not sure how much of this has been proved. We still don't know what happened to the, to the kids who disappeared, right? Who were, who were kidnapped apparently, partly uh, with his uh, knowledge, I gather. Although this is, you know, I'm, I'm getting into hearsay and rumor and so forth. His performance in, in East Timor would be another example that this is, this is a man who is accustomed to to using brute force, or at least uh, willing to tolerate brute force, and on the on the populism side, we also have a certain amount of nationalism, and I wonder to what extent, you know, compared to some of the others uh, who the two in particular who lost, one might say that he is likely to be a hyper nationalist. <laughs> this is, of course, a, a series of criticisms, and and I suppose one to be fair, should turn it around and make defenses, but I'm offering you the opportunity either to do that or, or at least to comment, all four of you, including Bill. What do you think? Well, I, let me pass because I, I think that my argument basically says, yes, that's where I think that this is going to go. Okay. Any other thoughts on that? So, so let me just say that um, on your comment, um, Don, that you know, allegations about the use of violence and sort of involvement in kidnapping is not something that's in doubt. I mean, he's admitted it, um, and you know, has to the to the ones who came back who who were who survived, he's apologized because a lot of them are members of his party now, right? And so, in some ways, we have to understand. You know, there's often questions from the from the <clears> press, <throat> and how is it that somebody with that background, with those levels of allegations can become president of a country that has tried to move away from it, its past. And we have to understand that it's part of a sort of structural part, uh, uh, feature of Indonesian democracy is that the, the democracy did not come with justice for the past. And so people who were involved in violence, and it's not just Prabhu Subianto, it's just one example of that, there was never any reckoning for those. And so that's part of the agreement of the democracy is that we're going to move forward, but we're not going to really look back because that will rock the boat too much, right? So in that sense, he's not alone in that. He just represents a larger larger phenomenon. The other sort of, you know, um, Bill's sort of thing, this is where it's moving. And, you know, Donald Trump is the example. I just want to have, you know, invite us to have a sort of think about where the guardrails of Indonesian democracy have come from, because He's certainly not the first threat to Indonesian democracy. You know, we've seen lots of moves under President Joko Widodo, who was heralded as the new hope for Indonesian democracy. I mean, he's done a lot in the last 10 years that 
you know, my colleagues here at the ANU and in other places, Indonesian universities have documented, right, that it's been a disappointing 10 years. It's been a disappointing decade for, for democracy um, from somebody who was expected to, to do much to further it. Um, so the question is, you know, where have these sort of safeguards come from and where are they going? One big safeguard for Indonesian democracy, which, you know, has been described by some scholars as an insider job, because basically it's the same group of elites who were ruling under the new order who then became Democrats once the democracy transitioned. And so one sort of big safeguard for this has come from civil society, people, students, civil rights activists, um, labor rights activists on the streets, right? So that's been one sort of big um, cushion for Indonesian democracy in the beginning. And the other has really come from elite interests who sort of agree to have some level of competition because that's good. It's good for them in a very sort of self-interested way. Now we've seen in the last 10 years um, that this sort of civil society movement or the civil society presence that has been a check on certain aspects of our authoritarian instincts um, of rulers in, Indo in democratic Indonesia has been dismantled slowly, right? Mm -hmm. And starts with the 2019 student protests where they're killed. I mean, this is the first time in which student protesters are killed since 1998. It was a big watershed moment in President Jokowi's presidency and for Indonesian democracy. And since we've seen sort of a systematic effort to dismantle civil society resistance. The other sort of aspect of elite competition, whereby elites agree to certain democratic rules and certain checks and balances on, on each other, in order to demo, uh, advance democracy because as a system, it works for them. What we've seen in the last 10 years is political parties who are now crying foul about the elections have systematically enabled this president to acquire more and more power and dismantle checks on executive authority, right? And so they have, in, in essence, they're the ones who have written the blank check that has been cashed in this election. Um, and so we are seeing is sort of a, a less and less of consensus within elites to to sort of exercise the horizontal accountability and sort of checks that would constrain a president from making these moves. Now, that's a dangerous place to be for those reasons, for a president who has been sort of talked about as somebody who has these instincts, who prefers a system that wasn't so competitive, who prefers certain, you know, a moderated version of, of democracy. So we are in a place that well, in, is more likely to enable somebody like that than we were 10 years ago. Yeah, it's an interesting contrast that you draw between structure and personality. And in a way, I think what you're saying is that the personality of uh, the winner of the election, uh, uh, Prabowo, matters less than how the structure has moved, you know, maybe little by little or in leaps and bounds, depending on how you interpret the policies under uh, Jokowi particularly. Uh, it's the structural problem that really means Indonesia's democracy is in considerable danger. And it's not something that we can just say that, you know, Prabowo is going to come in and he's going to, you know, you know, <laughs> declare a dictatorship or something like that. You know, I mean, Trump said the first day I'll be a dictator. I mean, he hasn't said that yet. And I doubt that he will say that right in Indonesia. It's a very different situation. So then the problem becomes, how do you deal with the structural deterioration of uh, democracy in Indonesia? But I also want to raise this, you know, I didn't expect to be taking this role, but uh, um, I think Bill's argument can be summarized to some extent in an emphasis on the Jokowi factor. And remember to the audience, Jokowi is simply an abbreviation of Joko Widodo, uh, of, the, of the existing, the incumbent president and the role that he played. And so rather than looking at the future and saying, what is Prabowo going to do? Perhaps the more interesting question is, what, if anything, is... Jokowi going to do. And I think Bill's comment in one of the slides basically was that once you're an ex-president, you lose a tremendous amount of clout. So maybe it doesn't matter that much. But on the other hand, with Gibran sitting there as a potential proof of dynasticism, right, of nepotism uh, in a major way, uh, I wonder if the role that Jacoby will be playing either directly or indirectly may matter more than 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 we think. Any comments on that? I'm I'm with Bill in, in the sense that I think Prabowo is likely to be on his own. I I I don't think I don't foresee Jokowi, you know, playing a dominant role in the future administration, despite the fact that Gibran is in the picture. 
let's let's not forget, you know, there is no vice presidential decree, right? There is only a presidential decree. Mm-hmm. And and that's not to belittle, you know, Gibran's uh, potential role in the future as a vice president. But, you know, Prabhu has been wanting to be in this position for the last 20 years. Almost the same as Biden, who had wanted it since 1990. <laughs> You know, he came to power in 19, I mean, 2016, I mean, 2020, he would have waited 30 years, probably 20 years. So I, I, I would, you know, I'm in a camp that thinks that I think he wants to be on his own and he wants to show the world that he can do it. And, and you know, at the end of the day, I do believe the economy matters. You know, we can talk about all the politics, uh, but if he doesn't deliver uh, on the economy, I think uh, Bill's prognosis is going to turn out okay I mean turn out right but if he gets his act together on the economy by way of better technocratizing the decision making process I think the politics will be different and and I'm in a camp that believes that democracy is not just about distribution of power to the hands of many it's got to be manifested in the way public goods are distributed to the hands of many and, and I think time will tell as to whether or not, you know, the economic development will entail a better delivery of public goods to the hands of many. Right, right. Well said. I'd like to say something different, actually. Um, my presentation is all gloom and doom so, <laughs> so far. But there is one thing about Indonesian democracy that occurred to me while Sana was talking. And it is the decentralization. You know, you have the national, the pattern of national elites and competition and so forth, but that pattern also exists at the local level. And that is really a tremendous thing. Mm-hmm. You know, we saw under President Habibi that process start um, of having decentralization primarily to the districts uh, and municipalities. Uh, and that has really flourished. Uh, of course, there's an attempt um, from the center that is continuing to reduce that and, and even to to take away the direct election of the Jakarta governor now and so forth. And, and hopefully that doesn't, doesn't come to pass. But, but the main point that, that I want to say is that Indonesia is a very diverse society. And that diversity gets reflected politically in all of these district uh, and municipality governments. And that's very amazing. You travel any place in the country and you see the vitality of local politics. I think uh, it's time to segue into some of the questions, although that doesn't mean that that any of the four of you can not just, you know, launch another argument or say whatever you wish. Yes. This is, you know, freedom of speech. Um, William Tuchrello has the following question on foreign policy. We haven't talked about that yet. It says, today's Indonesian news noted Retno, that is the current Retno Marsudi, the current foreign minister, may not be in the forthcoming government. Does this or could this mean Prabowo will have a more hands-on impact on foreign relations? And I guess implicit in that question is if he will play a greater role on foreign relations, then what will that role be? What will he do? I, I, I'm i in the camp that, sorry, am I, oh, am yeah. I allowed to say? Okay. Yeah, please. I, I tend to think that Prabowo is going to be much more proactive than Jokowi has been with regards to international affairs. And, and this was empirically manifested in his non-attendance to the United Nations meeting for the last nine years. And, and this is not to belittle Jokowi in the context of international relations, but I do believe Prabowo has a predisposition to international affairs. And this is also attributable to, I think, his desperation to score points Mm -hmm. with the global community. And it's not just the Western community, but it's also the non-Western community, inclusive of China. But it's got to boil down to, you know, the degree to which he's going to bring in, he's going to be able to bring in the money, you know, for capital formation purposes. Uh, And I, I do expect that there's likely to be some degree of recalibration from what we have seen in the last nine and a half years. We could assume that I think the last nine years or nine and a half years, Indonesia has been a bit more leaning towards China on the back of expecting that, you know, there's going to be massive capital formation from China, but it really hasn't come to fruition to the degree expected. So I think, you know, 
he's going to have to evaluate as to whether or not he's going to continue on this narrative with China or have a mix of you know that pre-existing narrative uh, with a new narrative by way of trying to placate with, with the West for purposes of capital formation. The important thing is to be able to increase that capital formation or the foreign direct investment, which I think will be necessary for the development of the economy going forward. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on this? If not- Hey, let, let me say, Don, um, you are the expert on Indonesian foreign policy. <laughs> Why don't you say something? In response, <laughs> well, first of all, I'm not an expert on much of anything. <clears throat> Gita knows full well that my knowledge of, you know, we talk about this. I mean, uh, I'm, but you're very kind to say that. And I will respond, and I'll respond in the following way that I take it, Gita, that your argument emphasizes the economy. And of course, that's very appropriate. Why did Jokowi become so popular? Surely it had a lot to do <clears throat> with the state of the economy and what he was able to do in terms of infrastructure, and we could go on and on and on. But then the flip side, which I think does show up in Bill's argument, is the politics, or the international politics, if I can put it that way. Now, we know that Indonesia declined in the end. There was a little bit of a dance. Would they join the BRICS or not? And for the audience, by BRICS, I mean the, the group of countries that now has been enlarged and claims in some sense to represent the global South, to be part of the global South. This is not a democracy, autocracy, East-West division like the Cold War of the last century, but rather a North-South distinction between the more developed countries, I suppose you could say, and then the less developed ones in the South as opposed to the North. And, um, and Indonesia in the end decided not to join. So an interesting question then, uh, is if you're right, and if uh, uh, Prabowo is going to play a more prominent role on foreign policy, what kind of a decision would he make with regard to that? Or would the decline economically, if that's not too strong a term, of China at the moment, make China less attractive as a partner to join with? And of course, once you join BRICS, you really join Chinese foreign policy because China is the dominant power within BRICS. What do you think? I'll make three comments. The, the, the first one is, I think he's gonna to try to project Indonesia onto the international scene, you know, in a more proactive manner for purposes of foreign direct investment, right? I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that he's gonna, you know, engage, you know, enough people that are gonna be good narrators of the Indonesian narrative for such purpose. The second obvious, goal would be in the context of the South China Sea, right? We all know that the code of conduct has been planned to be in place by 2026, whether it's gonna be in the shape of something that's non-binding with a high bar or binding with a low bar, so that that could be the basis or the foundation for the enforceability of the pre-judge you know, judge ruling you know, by UNCLOS, you know, in the context of the case between the Philippines and China. I think Prabhu is going to be proactive in saying something in that context, right? So that there is a better, call it unity, you know, amongst ASEAN by way of what we have seen in the past in the sense that there has been some degree of divisiveness. The third, I think with respect to BRICS, I would bet that Indonesia would choose not to join. I think the reason why we decided not to join the BRICS would have been on the basis that we did not want to be divisive, right? By way of joining the BRICS, I think would have projected Indonesia as part of that equation that would have been, you know, neither, I mean, you know, divisive, you know, with the West. And, and this goes back to my earlier comment. I think he's desperate to score points with the, the West by way of the fact that he would have been quote unquote banished or somewhat disregarded by the West. I think he wants to befriend the West. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that we could we could have a long discussion about that. Yeah, Sana, please. So can I can I ask a follow-up question uh to either yourself, Don, or to Gita about, you know, so so he's so we're hearing that he's very keen to impress the West, you know, partly because of his own background, but also for for economic reasons, because the economy would be so important. But we've also heard from him 
and heard him taking a much stronger line, at least in his campaigning uh, avatars, about Indonesia not wanting to get dominated, economically dominated from the West. You know, he took a very strong line against, for example, the European Union ban on um, on Indonesian palm oil, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so do you see him, because now he's got this, he's got this economic need, he's got this need to impress the West, but he's also got a constituency at home that he's built carefully over the past 20 years with the narrative that we will not be dominated, that Indonesia has this big place in the world and it does not deserve to be nominated dominated. How do you think he's going to balance that constituency, domestic constituency, with his international orientation? I'm, I'm, I'm in a camp that believes that capital formation is not highly impacted by the degree of nationalism, right? I would, I would even argue that Singapore has certain sectors that are a lot more protectionist than Indonesia. And by way of the recently promulgated omnibus law, which I believe is a much more liberalized framework than whatever we had you know, previously, it still hasn't entailed you know, commensurate or whatever amount that we expected to come mm -hmm. into Indonesia. The reason why it hasn't come is because of the lack of enforceability of rules and regulations. This goes back to my earlier com comparison between what Indonesia and the others in Southeast Asia have been able to attract in terms of capital formation vis-a-vis -vis Singapore. People park money in Singapore because of their trust with respect to the system, because the system works. Mm -hmm. It's the enforceability. And you take a look at the telecommunications sector in Singapore, it's more protectionist than that in Indonesia, where we liberalize up to 100% for anybody to mm -hmm. own 100% of any teleco company. But by way of the lack of enforceability. So I think the discount or the potential discount in the narrative of Indonesia going forward would be attributable to the degree to which we can actually enforce rules and regulations. Right, that's very well put. I mean, you know, the notion that Indonesia could become Singapore <laughs> geographically and demographically. That's a big ask, Don. Yeah, <laughs> that's a big ask. That's a huge ask, right. But you're right. I mean, I think, you know, we could apply that to relations around the world. Trust is terribly important. And, and how you develop that, you develop it by having institutions that are honest and so forth and so on. So I think your your point is very well taken. I mean, with regard, I can't resist before we leave the topic of foreign policy, unless there's some questions. And incidentally, I should have said at the beginning that please use the Q&A. If you're in the audience, use the Q&A. Uh, and many of you have already done that. And we'll get into some of your questions right now. But but with regard to the South China Sea, just to take one example, and I could talk forever about that, and I'll try to avoid doing that. Uh, of course, we have a, a, an unusual situation uh, at the moment uh, in the progress of the chairmanship as it rotates among the 10 members of ASEAN. You know, Laos, the last time I checked, is uh, not a maritime power. <laughs> uh, they're the only country in Southeast Asia that doesn't even have a coastline, right? Uh, so maybe we just have to, to take a breather on 2024. But after that, we have Malaysia and then the Philippines, both of whom are claimants in the South China Sea. And one of the most fascinating things which people have completely ignored, uh, perhaps with the exception of me, and I don't know anybody else who has mentioned it, which is on the 30th of December, the meeting of the foreign ministers of ASEAN that took place and that issued a statement not you know, by the chair of the meeting, when you get a statement by the chair of the meeting, what that means is the people who attended the meeting didn't really believe in it and were worried that they'd get in trouble if they signed it. And so they let the chair say present a, a statement, which then doesn't really represent necessarily the true feelings of the members that were gathered. But this is to all 10 foreign ministers, including the Laotian minister, who is very much indebted, as you probably know, to China, uh, one could argue, therefore, tilting toward China. They all agreed to refer to something as the maritime sphere. This is the first time this phrase has been used, which is you would have thought people would have been on the front page or something. No, no, not at all. Completely ignored. The maritime sphere, which is not defined, but it is identified repeatedly. It five is mentioned five different times in the statement, which only goes on for a couple of pages as our sphere. This is Southeast Asia's sphere, this, the maritime sphere of Southeast Asia, our sphere. The possession is explicit, right? 
And I don't think they meant our sphere. And then there's China over there. Oh, yeah, you've got a sphere, too. That's great. Yeah, great. We'll have our sphere. You'll have your sphere. Oh, no problem. No. I think they meant that the South China Sea is the heart water of Southeast Asia. And as we know, Indonesia is one of the few countries in the world that I'm aware of as an archipelagic nation that actually talks about Tana Air. We don't talk about the land. It's not just the land. It's the land water that is our, you know, uh, our, our legacy. And so the opportunity is there. But I have no idea whether the decision not to rehire Retno, if that is in fact a decision that has been made, will give us any kind of a clue as to what uh, Prabowo might do with regard to the South China Sea. But there is clearly an opportunity there because other countries in Southeast Asia have for a long time been waiting for Indonesia, the largest country of all, a thoroughly archipelagic maritime country to stand up and lead and lead Southeast Asia in a direction that will prevent the kind of abuse that is going on right now as the Chinese you know, so-called Coast Guard vessels, you know, violate international law. Anyway, I'm sorry I talked more than I should. Okay, let's get back to the uh, to the Q&A, unless there's any other comment that any of the four of you can, please feel free to interrupt at any time uh, for any point that you wish uh, to make. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Scott Marcel, my colleague <clears throat> here, former ambassador to a number of Southeast Asian countries, what is your sense of how credible the investigations into these alleged election irregularities will be? And how much confidence do you think Indonesian voters themselves have in that process? This goes back to Gita's point about trust. How would you answer that question? Any of you? I would I would defer to Sana or Bill. Yeah, Sana. <laughs> Sana. Sana talked about well, this already. Yeah. Yeah, so so there are two types of um, investigations that can be done. So one, that it's important to remember that everybody is always unhappy. I mean, that after every election in Indonesia, there's always an unhappy party, and then they usually do take the challenge the results in the constitutional court, which was designed in part to deal with these kinds of issues. Um, the constitutional court, my understanding is that primarily examines evidence of electoral fraud on the election day, ma manipulation of votes, those kinds of things. Um, and I, as I said, there is evidence of, of some of that. I, I don't know how it will be um, assessed on to, in terms of scale to deliver. Uh, I think it's extremely un unlikely that it will lead to a change in the outcome based on that. The other thing that we have been hearing is a parliamentary inquiry or investigation into the process, which includes allegations of wrongdoing before the election, so in, in days leading up to the polls, to increase support for the winning candidate um, and the role of state um, uh, state officials in doing that, as well as irregularities on the election day itself. The problem is you would need some support in parliament to be able to do that. Um, and we don't know if the losing parties, now they are losing for the presidential candidates who are obviously extremely unhappy about it, but then they, the parties that support them, we are not sure if they will um, challenge the president in this very public and open way. Um, so we'll have to wait and see how, how that sort of a thing um, pans out. In terms of trust, you've seen in, in the past election, especially in the 2019 election, 2024 election, uh, 2014 elections, that people generally have trust in the democratic process, but oftentimes their sort of perceptions of their trust in the democratic system, specifically in the electoral system, is based on whether or not their candidate uh, won. So there, you know, people who tend to lose then in that election cycle at least tend to have a lower trust cycle. So it's not a permanent thing. And so I think that we will continue to see that pattern in this particular election as well. It's the one that lost that will probably have a higher perception of um, a lower perception of trust in, in the democratic process. Any other comments on that? No. Okay. Uh, another colleague of mine, sorry if I'm favoring my colleagues, they're just showing up on the list of questioners, Tom Finger, whose office is just right across from mine right now. What did Indonesians who voted for Prabowo think they were voting for? Continuity of Jokowi's economic policy or something else? Did they vote to change the constitution or was that an invisible issue, contention? Will Prabowo feel constrained to meet the expectations of those that voted for him? <clears throat> I can't. The, 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 the voting for some sort of continuation of what we have seen 
is despite, not because of the economy, right? I think it's an important distinction. And, and as I illustrated earlier, the economy could have done better in the last nine and a half years. You know, when we started off almost 10 years ago, we were the 15th largest economy in the world. We're now the 16th largest economy in the world. India started off 10 years ago as the 10th largest economy in the world. India right now is the fifth largest economy in the world. The GDP per capita in Indonesia has only grown by around 40% on a nominal basis as compared to the preceding 10 years at a rate of 190%. The tax revenues have gone up only by about 46% in the last nine and a half years, as opposed to the preceding 10 years, which would have grown at about 190 something percent. So despite that seeming underperformance of the economy, people still love Jokowi, right? And they love this new Gamoy character, which would have been projected to the people as in cute, right? So I, I, I do believe that I think social media has played a big role. And we live in this era where it's tough to tell the difference between facts and fiction, right? Where democracy has been somewhat equated with algorithmic amplification on a social media platform where people are actually spending about nine or 10 hours a day on their mobile phones. Mm -hmm. So that I think is, is a much bigger factor until such time that there's no food on the table. I think we're gonna have an inflection point. So that, that, that would be my two cents worth. Yeah, thank you, thank you. May there I? Is, sorry, yes, please, please. Um, yeah, the, um, in my presentation, I don't say anything about the Gomoy factor. <laughs> um, I have to think about that some more for the revised version. But, but the main point of the, of the presentation, the, the biggest bulk of the um, statistical evidence about uh, voters, um, you can see what, what I presented it in that one in the first slide, you know, that shows that the 70% of people who think that Jokowi is performing well, those are also the people who increasingly wanted to vote for Prabowo. So I think, and but if you look, Tom, if you go on and look at the other slides um, in my presentation, the ones that I didn't present, there are several that focus on this economic issue and, and show, you know, Prabowo rising with Jokowi and all of those kinds of things. So, so if, if you look at those, I think that you'll see that this was a really important uh, issue. Moving can I quick. add on? Sure, Sorry, please. can I just add on that? I think I have a different perception from Pargita about the impact of the economy on whether or not people like Jokowi and would want to have it continued. People who are satisfied with Jokowi's performance, which is about 80% of Indonesians yes. in the last survey that we saw, a large number of them, in fact, a majority of them say that they are satisfied because of economic reasons, because they're getting um, welfare assistance, because they're satisfied with his infrastructure um, projects, et cetera. We also know that, you know, in the last survey that I saw about August 2023 from Compass, I think 60% of Indonesians are satisfied with the economy. So there are problems with the economy, but people are experiencing something that is making them satisfied um, with, with, with their, the economic performance of the country. And a large part of that has to be the allocation of the social assistance welfare funds um, that they have been sort of receiving, despite the fact that other indicators might be might have been worrying. No. No disagreement. No disagreement. I, I was only trying to make the point that there was no non-performance. There was only underperformance. That's right. But 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 I think things will change as soon as we hit the point when there is no food on the table. Okay, moving quickly forward because the queue of questions has twenty-eight questions in it, and we're not going to be able to get through all of them. I will pass one simply by saying. It is a defense and therefore good for this panel. We need all sides of an argument. There is a defense of, uh, of Prabowo. I'll just quote a couple of sentences from that defense. As a young man, Prabowo was uh, attending the Young Socialists Conference. In other words, he comes from a democratic socialist background. His father was a member of the PSI. The PSI had only two aims, people's welfare and democracy. Those will also be his aims, right? So I just throw that out as a point of view that's very useful to add to the critique that uh, 
I and others on the panel have, have made. And here's a very important question from Jim Riker. This election has planetary implications and consequences for the global climate. None of the candidates addressed the stances on addressing the climate, protecting Indonesia's tropical forests, phasing out coal, fossil fuels, while leading just clean energy transition. Will Indonesia jeopardize the country's and the planet's future? Question mark. Look, I, you know, what's paradoxical is that many developing countries, I think, recognize the need to do things that are noble, things that are good to the planet, right? But I think what the developed economies need to understand and recognize is that there's a lot of structural limitations. The technology is there from the West, from the G7 countries plus China, but the money is not flowing into the developing economies. Most developing economies, if they wanna decarbonize, they've gotta build new power generation capabilities that could only charge at most five cents on a per kilowatt basis. Whereas the new you know, renewable energy power generation capabilities, whether it's hydro, solar, geothermal, much less nuclear, you know, you got to charge at least 15 cents on a per kilowatt basis. So how do you bridge the gap between five cents, which is the affordable level, and the 15 cents, which is the bottom level that, you know, people need to charge in order to be able to make money. So somebody needs to figure out, I think technologically we have the solution, but economically we don't have the solution. And this is the part where I think it becomes much more challenging because we live in an era where multilateralization is on a major decline in spite of this increasing multipolarity. So I think the Indonesian government, Prabowo's leadership, I think would have to figure out how to narrate Indonesia's narrative a little bit better so that we could attract this money so that we can you know, accelerate the decarbonization before we start doing things that are you know, necessary for purposes of you know, the preservation of the forest and you know, the, the circular economy. I, th I think we've got to go beyond this defeatism you know, to, to achieve this optimism, but the reality on the ground is you know, it's expensive. You know, just, just to give you a sense for Southeast Asian countries to properly decarbonize so that they can achieve a kilowatt, you know, a 6,000 kilowatt hour per capita so that they can all become modern. It's gonna require at least $2 trillion. Who's gonna bring that money? You know, at the rate that our economy is so structurally limited, our tax ratio is less than 10%. Our money supply to GDP ratio is less than 100%. Indonesia's money supply to GDP ratio is 45%. When all the developed economies' money supply to GDP ratios are, you know, at, at, at above 150%. So I think there needs to be better communication and, I don't know, storytelling. So that, that, I think, is the job of the new leadership to figure out that we can tell the story a little bit better. This question, I hope uh, this is directed, I'm directing it, not by the uh, questioner, I'm directing it to Gita, to you. And I, 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 I urge brevity here because we don't have time to get into this topic, which is a little far afield, but nevertheless, an intriguing notion. The person asking the question suggests that uh, maybe Indonesia should consider taking part in a global cryptocurrency. Does that make any sense to you? That would be an interesting change. That's a separate webinar, Don. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a believer of anything that's finite in supply. I'm a believer anything that's technologically sound, right? Okay. I'm a believer of anything that serves as the intersection between anything that travels over time and anything that travels over space. Right. Fortunately or unfortunately, Bitcoin checks all those boxes. Right. I'm not a believer of all the other cryptos, but I think Bitcoin is something that I think most people around the world need to take a look at more. Right. I, I'm, I'm not comfortable with the fact that the United States has gone away with massive quantitative easing as to increase the supply of money. Intrinsically, I think that lowers the price per unit, the value per unit. Uh, and and we're, not, we're not privileged enough to, to, to be able to do our own you know, version of quantitative easing. And this is manifested in how low our money supply to GDP ratio is, which is only at about 
and the U.S. is at about 200 percent and Singapore is at about 200 percent. So I think somebody needs to figure out how to rebalance all this imbalance. OK, we're going to move quickly forward. Um, one question which is asked in different form by various people is, will the new regime in Indonesia tilt toward China or the West? That's an obvious question, and it could lead to an endless discussion. We don't have time for that. But we do have time for your opinions, your guesses as to the future with regard to Indonesia's position vis-a-vis -vis China on the one hand and uh, the West uh, on the other. And the other question uh, is an internal question. How do you think the new administration in Indonesia will handle Papua and other issues of potentially or actually separatist, separatist movements arising inside the country? Anyone for either of those? Well, the new administration will almost certainly deal more harshly with Papua uh, because that's Prabowo's history. But it is also the case that previous presidents, uh, back to Megawati and so forth, have often taken harsh lines toward Papua. Uh, Jokowi tried at least uh, to have a maritime policy and to to open to Papua more and uh, and so forth. But in the end, the military just took over Papua. And I don't think Prabowo has any intention of changing that. Good. OK, so I'll pass on the on the West China distinction. But that question is all, always on the table in the rest of the program. Can I, can yeah. I make a comment on that, Don? Yeah, please, please. I, I think it's important not to underestimate the agency that has existed right. in Southeast Asia. Right. right? And, and I, wanna, I wanna draw everybody's attention to history here. In the last 2000 years, Southeast Asia has prevailed with fantastic, relatively fantastic peace and stability by way of the number of lives lost, you know, by way of differences and opinions or views with regards to race, religion, and ethnicity. If we were to compare ourselves with what's happened in Europe in the last 2000 years. So I think, Southeast Asia is much more accustomed to embracing some sort of multipolarity, right? So this new kind of multipolarity that's right in front of us, I think is something that we have gotten used to in the past, and we should be able to do that. And, and our degree of agency, I think, is only going to get better if we improve upon our economic development. And, and I, I'm not in the camp that believes that we've got to choose between China and the US, you know, for a region of scale with 700 million people and $4 trillion collective economy, I think we've got to be able to have that optionality. And, and this is something that I've, you know, articulated, you know, a few times to you and in other fora. Uh, it, it is a pretty sizable region and it is a region that has proven to show agency. We have a question on Jacoby's plan to move the capital city from Jakarta to Nusantara, this new proposed site for a capital in East Kalimantan. Uh, do any of you think this will actually happen? Uh, it's scheduled, at least, but will it actually happen? And will it be a mistake or not? Why? I'll, I'll let the others first. I mean, I have, I, have a, I have a comment on this, but yeah. Please, Bill. Yeah, I haven't followed it closely enough. Uh, of course, um, much will depend upon whether Prabowo is committed to it or not, and this all involves also yeah. his land ownership in the area and, and yeah. these kinds of uh, things, but um, I, I, it's unpredictable. For, for an undertaking that's going to cost the government between 40 to $80 billion, mm -hmm. in reference to what we talked about earlier, by way of our structural limitations, i.e. tax ratio of 9.5%, and our portion of the budget that's required to service the debt having gone up from 6% to 16%, there is a structural limitation. So it will progress in incrementalism to the extent that we can increase our tax ratio to 20% as aspired by Prabowo, then I think it will happen with greater speed. But, but I think there's a structural limitation with which you know we're gonna be able to move on the capital city. How do any of you perceive the outlook for women's rights under a Prabowo presidency?
thundering silence. <laughs> well, I was hoping the gentleman would like to take a stab at this, but it, it usually does fall <laughs> um, on the woman palinist. So I'll, I'll say this, that there wasn't any very clear um, in the, at least in the platforms that, that Prabhu and Gibran put out, there wasn't any very clear sense of what sort of their gender policy would be. We weren't able to find any strong insinuations of that, except for that they think that women should have um, better access to folic acid um, when they are pregnant and they should have better nutrition. Um, so the sort of role of women as childbearers seems to be sort of the main thing in that in that vision. I should say that this is something that you know it cannot only be looked at from you know their own platform or policies or whatever they're proposing. There is a very strong um, lobbying of of women's rights activists in Indonesia, and despite hurdles and challenges, they have managed to get serious legislation passed. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would expect them to continue to work with the new administration and and can you continue to pursue that even if they don't have any ideas themselves. Any other comments? Suryani Eka Vijaya wants to know how we see the chance, as she puts it, for Anis, Anis Baswedan. What role will he play? Will he be able to help to lead the future of Indonesia? Any comments? <clears throat> yeah. Go ahead. I don't go, think ahead. So. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sana, go ahead. So, uh, so you, you don't think so? Is that right, Bill? I don't, I, I, um, he has to redefine himself if he okay. is going to play a role in the future. Uh, he, came, he came off third, of course, and since the Jakarta gubernatorial mm -hmm. election, he's been uh, stamped as an Islamist or somebody who is too prone to looking for support from Islamists. So he has to kind of step, step back now that he has lost and rethink what his options are. So he might play, he's a very smart person on this. Um, and it's possible that he can play a role in the future, but he has to start from the beginning. So Anis is, in my view, one candidate who did better than expected, apart from Prabowo as well, right? So he mm -hmm. did come in second, and his showing was a little stronger than what was predicted, mm -hmm. um, which shows that he does have a core group of supporters who are willing to support him either because they don't like Djokovic's policies, because he's the only person who put himself forward as somebody who's going mm -hmm. to change things, um, or because they sort of sort of have appeal because of his Islamist image um, due to the previous elections where he was a contender for Jakarta governorship. I think when we think about an, an individual who can bring change to Indonesia, it's very hard to do because a lot of it depends on the political backing of organizations and the structures that they get. Now, Anis is not really sort of a party person. He's not you know, affiliated with clearly sort of a member, card-carrying member of any particular party. So it would depend a lot on his ability to build a political coalition. One thing he does have in his favor is that he's young um, and he's a good, smooth talker. Um, people like the way he talks. Even people who are watching Indonesian presidential debates felt that he was a good communicator, despite the fact that he did not agree with his ideas. Um, and so it would really depend on how he builds a political coalition moving forward and whether um, he's able to sort of put himself forward as a representative of something bigger than just his ideas. I have to admit I, that I think the, the fact that he, please, you know, used identity politics in the gubernatorial race was was a bit of a discount. But you know, I believe in the evolution of people, and having met him and and the other candidates in, in the last you know couple of months, it, it was a breath of fresh air, listening to his ability to intellectualize. And, and I say this with emphasis that we're pushed in a corner where we have to choose people or select talent on the base of, on the base of more sensationalization, right? The fact that we have a candidate that can intellectualize slightly better, if not much better than the others, is a breath of fresh air. Number two, the fact that he was able to garner 25% of the 200 million votes, that's 50 million votes, I think that speaks of the long future he has. Fair enough. And I have to admit that of the three candidates for president, he's the only one that I know. And I actually know him quite well. Uh, I've known him for many, many years. His uh, degree is from an American university, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I agree with you. Uh, he is very impressive. I think there is a topic, however, that involves him uh, that 
has not been discussed so far. Maybe we don't have time because no one is asking it that I can find yet. I'm not all the way down to the last uh, question. And that is the role of Islamism in Indonesia. Because I think, uh, Gita, you were you were implying in a way exactly what was on my mind thinking about uh, Anis, which is why he chose to link up with Islamist forces in Indonesia, which obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, nothing is obvious, but it seems to me, in my opinion, move away from the intellectualizing character that impressed you, that it also has impressed me over the years, right? Why he did that uh, for perhaps a very pragmatic reason. He wanted their votes. He wanted to win or something. And of course, that was at a time with regard to the issue involving Ahok and so forth, that the election did not loom. So I don't think we should read the election politics backwards into what happened then. But it, but it does seem to me that the role of Islamism in Indonesia and how the, after all, it is a Muslim majority country, how Islam will develop in relationship to the politics and the economics that we've been talking about, I think is a fascinating question and a very important one. And I don't think we have time for it, but we have a little time left if anybody wants to comment further on that, on Islamism in particular. And if not, we'll keep going. Well, so one of the so one of the, the the sort of encouraging signs in this particular election, despite the sort of very credible allegations of state level meddling um, in in the campaign, was that we did not see the kind of polarization that we did, the religious polarization that we did in two thousand and nineteen. It was a very different election from that mm -hmm. sense. Um, and so the sort of hopeful thing to take away from this is that you may win a governorship with that sort of a message but you'll have a tough time winning a presidency, um, even in Indonesia, with that sort of a message, right? And so you saw both Prabowo and Anis. So Anis is not the only one who's run on this message. Prabowo has as well, right? Right. But now that he is elected, he did not um, he did not win this election on the basis of sort of that, promoting that sort of a message. And so in a country as diverse as Indonesia, Islam and its political role does have an appeal. But it seems that at least for now, in order to win the presidency of the whole country, um, you better not bring that to the table. And, and we've, we've, this is not uniquely Indonesian, Don. I mean, we've seen this right. in the U.S. where candidates are actually moving right. along the spectrum. Right. So for, for purposes of attaining power. So that's yeah. that's an evolution of, you know, any candidate. Right, exactly. Will Prabowo move the Indonesian constitution back to the content that it had in 1945, well, all the way back to the end of World War II, deleting from that context the amendments that made it democratic or more democratic, more obviously democratic. Is that going to happen? Will there be constitutional regression under Prabowo? I claimed yes in my presentation. How about everybody else? There's, Gita is silent and so is. <laughs> my my, oh, my sense is. Correct here. But let, let me say this. Look, I, I think it's going to boil down to accountability. Right. I mean, if if the current system does not yield a better redistribution of welfare. Then I think we've got to look at ourselves and potentially re-legislate. I'm I'm not in a camp that believes that we've got to re-legislate re just because we want to, you know, without having to be accountable. But but I think at the end of the day, it has to be driven by accountability. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So my sense is that Indonesian voters for the past 20 years have been highly satisfied with their democracy, despite the fact that there have been hiccups and they've been dissatisfied with particular aspects of it. So I don't think that we are at a point economically or politically when where there is mass demand for you know sort of large scale political change or overhauling of the system, I don't see that um, in the numbers. But um, the fact is that it's not just a you know it's not just a demand based game, right? So there are people in Prabowo's coalition, and at, at times Prabowo himself has said that he would like to re revert to that system. My worry is in that something like that would actually happen. I think that there are interests, strong interests. Uh, against making that happening, especially in under a Prabowo presidency, my fear is that the attempt to do so will be confrontational and it will raise questions about Indonesia's stability. Um, we know from 1998, 99, 2000, that large scale constitutional change 
sort of this overhaul uh, throw up of institutions creates a lot of anxieties within um, faraway regions of Indonesia where people don't understand how their role will be. Local elites don't understand how their role might be in a new system. And so an attempt just for, for sport or just to try um, could also have some damaging consequences. And that's really the fear. I actually don't think that they'll be able to pass something like that. That's my fear oh. as well. It's the conflict. Yeah. Yeah. But but let's 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 think about this, right? I mean, at at, at this moment, he's probably in control of about 40% of the votes by way of the pre-existing coalition. But if 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 we were to read it correctly, you know, in the context of the meeting between Surya Palo and Jokowi just yesterday and the additional meetings that could take place, you know, it could be conceivable that it's it could go up to sixty to seventy percent of the votes that or, or the representation in parliament that he's going to be able to control. Mm -hmm. That's going to pave way for, you know, any kind of legislation that he wishes, but but he he better be accountable to whatever he re-legislates or what he legislates. Amana Nurish. Uh, an excellent scholar who happens to be at Stanford, uh, whom I admire a lot, um, has a question for you, Sana. Uh, knowing that you have specialized in violence in Indonesia, I mean, I shouldn't put it that way, you have studied, <laughs> sorry, you have studied violence in Indonesia uh, and written about it. What do you think is the possibility that there will be violent groups engaged in violence against the leadership of Prabowo during his administration? So I think that we have to, you know, so first of all, imagine what these resistance group would, groups would potentially want. And I think that, you know, it's, it's very unclear at the moment that there would be such a movement. Um, in 2019, we saw that the election results were protested by supporters of Prabowo Subianto's own coalition. Right, so it wasn't that the that his election would be then protested in a similar way is difficult for me to imagine. Um, I think um, that the parties that are um, distressed with the election results and disagree with it would are more likely to pursue um, constitutional court as a source of um, addressing their concerns or raise it in the parliament. I don't see violent protests um, in the short in the in the near future um, against the outcome of the result. What of, the, legal, of the election. What legal or judicial reforms could we expect under a Prabowo administration? That's specific. Well, I, I, I think the key ones are the attempt to move back to the Constitution of 1945, which is a huge move if, if he actually attempts to do it. Yeah. Right. The other one would be possibly um, end of direct elections in the local elections. That's something that has been talked oh, right. about before. Ending. Their coalition mm -hmm. sort of right. has proposed it before. And so that would be something to see um, right. whether or not they sort of go back to the system where local parliaments elect the local executives rather than people directly voting for their governors or their mayors. Right. Which is very popular. I mean, right. the current system is very popular in most regions. Yeah. Right. We have a complicated question, which I, I'm with apologies to the person that asked it. It's just too long to get into with regard to the possibility that Indonesians retain some kind of a colonial complex. But I, I we don't have time to get into that. And we are over time. Uh, I'm I'm exploiting the three of you. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, we're not as long as Lisa is willing to play the critical role that she plays administering all this. We're, we're OK for a few more minutes. Uh, is there anything that you would like to ask, questions that have not been raised or that you think should pay, we should pay for, more attention to before I call it a day? I, I just want to say that as much as I try to infuse optimism into the picture by way of the prospect of further or a higher degree of technocratization, there's still likely to be a very strong element of political IOUs, just by way of the coalescing <laughs> forces, right? And these political IOUs have been agreed upon by Prabowo and the coalition members, which I, I think could serve as a discount, right? So 
to the extent that the meritocratization is going to work out okay in delivering a better economic performance, that's good. Yeah. But it could have a headwind by way of the political IOUs, which could serve as a discount. But I guess the question is, I mean, I, I hate to, you know, it's a typical imperialist action to sort of take something happens to be the case in the United States and transplant it into a foreign country. You know, it's it's an illegitimate uh, <laughs> violation of what scholarship is supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. However, having said that, at least the notion that you're talking about, technocratization, interesting concept, has been accompanied by a reaction, I think, against technocratic elites, uh, overeducated technocratic elites, that has developed something that is being called not just a personality phenomenon associated with Donald Trump, but something bigger than that, populism, populism. And so I guess my question is, are there forces in favor of populism that would resist the technocratization that you endorse and support and would like to see happen? And, and that may be attempted but will there be counter, you know, counterweighing moves, perhaps even including some of the violence that uh, Sana has studied? Because that does seem to be to be, you know, potentially the case here in the United States. Yeah. No, no disagreement. I think it's quite likely yeah. that there's going to be a compensating factor, you know, coming from the populism, <clears throat> and and that that's going to be manifested in the appointment of political appointees for economic purposes. Right as we have seen in the last nine and a half years. You, you, we have seen the chairman of a political party you know, running one economic portfolio, another chairman of a political party running another economic portfolio and senior party stalwarts you know, being you know, stationed at you know, ministerial levels within the economic portfolios. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that is, uh, I think, a, a risk that you know, we could be exposed to. Yeah. This, um, this pattern has deep roots. Uh, the decline of constitutional democracy in the 1950s um, describes the same kind of behavior in the first parliamentary government, you know, where, where all of the cabinets were chosen in terms of party uh, membership and, and uh, so forth. So, so in 2000, that pattern just began to reassert itself. Well, so, uh, sorry. Sorry, I just want to... No, I just, I just want to raise one final sort of question for everybody else to think about and we, as we sort of sure. think Good. about the, Good. Good. the results of these elections and how things might develop. The really important question to think about, you know, I think moving forward is what will what lessons will different types of people draw from the from the victory of Gibran and and Prabhu, right? And so I was really um, in some ways not, you know, um, not shocked, but surprised to hear Bill, who is the, the leading scholar of elections under the new order, so clearly draw the line between what he's seen in this election and the past, right? And my concern is what lessons will be drawn by the people who were involved in these elections, who have won these elections? Will it be that if they can get away with this level of meddling in the elections, is that something that's going to become a permanent feature of elections in Indonesia? I don't agree with people and folks who are saying they will, this is the end of all elections. I don't think so. Indonesian people are very cheerfully participating in their elections. I think it would be very hard to take that away from them in any way. Uh, but I do worry about the competitiveness of the election and if the lesson learned from this experience is that, oh, this works and we should be able to do that more um, in, in future rounds. Mm -hmm. Right. That's my fear, Bill, of course, for the future, too. Well, if you don't mind, let me add to that question and load it on your shoulders, <laughs> because you really are the expert. What is the danger of nepotism, dynasticism, that one can't help notice that danger, right, as somehow mm -hmm. implicit in... You're the, asking me that question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, should should we be worried about, I mean... You know, I'm I'm with Gita. Let's have you know, let's have you know, educated people and all of that. You know, technocracy mm -hmm. is all you know, assuming know. limits is mm -hmm. important. But on the other hand, if the future really is going to be the future of a family, what kind of trouble are we in for? Or maybe well, that's just the way things may turn out, and maybe it won't be so bad. I'm not so worried about that. It's not the nepotism that is the issue. It's what happened in the constitutional court. 
you know, Megawati practices nepotism. Yudo Yono practices nepotism. Every local politician tries to uh, have his wife succeed him or children or whatever. Um, so I don't know, this is human nature or a combination of poor resources and human nature or whatever, but I don't, I'm not concerned about that aspect of it. Um, it's right. okay if Gibran succeeds, but he should have succeeded, you know, if he succeeds to uh, the presidency, uh, but that should have happened uh, with a fair election. Well, I guess the, the counter argument would be that the sitting president has intervened in the election in a dramatic way. Right. And that's uh, what I'm complaining about. And there is a parental tie uh, to the vice president of Indonesia. Uh, right. right. Sorry, Don, the, 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 I think the concern that Bill is, is, is articulating is that it's not about dynasty. It's not about nepotism. But the real concern is about abuse of power. Right. Um, that made this okay. possible. Okay. I I want to share a slightly <laughs> different view, and and this is not just you know for convenience purposes, but it's it's clear that the political processes until today, for the last couple of decades, have been influenced by two large oligarchical forces. Right. The first one being economic. The second one being political. It's safe to assume that these pre-existing oligarchical forces have been led by people of age. And I don't foresee them being around in the next political process in the context of decision-making, mm. right? They may not also be around physically, mm. right? Mm. So inevitably there is, and there has been, and there will be a regeneration of talent within each one of these two oligarchical forces. Mm. And I'd like to, just share that, you know, knowing many of them, you know, they've been much better educated than their parents. They've been educated in academic domain where they learn to be internationalist, right? So that, that I think will dovetail into the betterment of decision-making mm -hmm. within the two oligarchical forces. So we might see, I think, an inflection, you know, in the next five years in the context of the political process in the sense that whatever you see, it's going to be more internationalist as opposed to less internationalist. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go to the specifics of whether or not, you know, we're going to see a continuation of the co-optation of institutions, but I think there's going to be a higher degree of internationalism by way of the education mm -hmm. of the children of these pre-existing oligarchical forces. Yeah, well, respond to that. Bill? You respond to that. I think the term oligarchy is too strong a, a label to apply to the Indonesian economy or politics. I used to think a long time ago that it was a very useful label to apply to the Philippines, you know, where you have all of these wealthy landowners who translate that directly into politics. Uh, what you have in Indonesia is rich businessmen. That's on the economic side. You have rich businessmen, some of whom are in conflict with others. You can't have an oligarchy in which the members are in conflict with each other. Um, also on the political side, it's too strong to say that the political party leaders or whatever constitute oligarchies. And, and once you start to go down in the system, then you have thousands upon thousands of local level politicians and so forth. And so for them too, I think the term oligarchy is not helpful. Fair enough. Sure. On that note, uh, I want to thank the four of you, you know, <laughs> the, the four musketeers, right? You, you were terrific. You, all of you were just great. I learned a lot from this. Mm -hmm. uh, really did. Thank you so much. And I want to thank the, the folks uh, out there in the real world uh, who asked 45 different questions, too many of which uh, I couldn't go into, and I, have, uh, I must apologize to them. And then finally, uh, and certainly uh, last, but by no means least, to Lisa Lee, without whom all of this would not have happened, uh, who was just an invaluable uh, assistant, uh, more than assistant, a colleague, right? Really a colleague uh, that manages to keep the Southeast Asia program alive. Uh, I wanna thank her as well. So it's been great fun for me and I hope you've enjoyed it. And I think the audience, I hope has enjoyed it as well. Thank you, and I wish you the very best going forward.